Um, it's quite a pleasure to introduce Dr. Andrew Gelman, who will today give a talk about his acclaimed book, Red State, Blue State, Rich State, Poor State, Why Americans Vote the Way They Do, as part of the Authors at Google program. Dr. Gelman is a professor of statistics and political science and director of the Applied Statistics Center at Columbia University. He's received an award for outstanding statistical application from the American Statistical Association, an award for best article published in the American Political Science Review, and the, and the Council of Presidents of Statistical Societies, say that four times fast, award for outstanding contributions by a person under the age of 40. Um, in addition to this Red State, Blue State book, he's the author on several other books, Bayesian Data Analysis, Teaching Statistics, A Bag of Tricks, and also a book about using uh, data analysis, using regression, multi-level hierarchical models. Um, he's a prolific researcher on a lot of, a lot of topics, including uh, rationality of voting and the probability that your vote will be decisive. Um, I voted in Florida in 2000, so it was close to being true, I suppose, in that case, 600 votes or something. Um, the variability of campaign polls in the context of actually what are pretty predictable election results, um, redistricting articles about why that's good for democracy, social network structures, a lot of other things, just to name a few. And then, of course, with statistics, methods and surveys, experimental design, statistical inference, computation, graphics, and software to do a lot of this, just to name some. Um, this particular this whole entire body of work, and this book in particular, Red State, Blue State, has been blogged about quite a bit on places like Freakonomics, Matthew Iglesias, Andrew Sullivan, 538.com, where I think you're now a contributor. Um, and of course, uh, Dr. Gelman runs his own blog, which is quite a great read. Um, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Gelman here to Google and to the Authors at Google program. <laughs> Well, it's a privilege to be here. I, you won't be surprised to know that I use your software every day. Um, <coughs> um, every election, um, 2008 included, could be viewed as a contest between two views of the future. Uh, could someone make it less hissy? It was sort of better for a while, and then it got hissy again. Or maybe it's yeah, this. OK, can you do that? Thanks. Um, <coughs> now, as we might say in California, it's a contest between liberal dynamism or fearful conservatism. Is the majority of Americans confident enough to look to the future, or does fear keep them in the past? Or, as people might say elsewhere in the country, what vision is going to win this time, the liberal nanny state or conservative policies that unleash the power of the free market while respecting the effectiveness of families and local communities? You can't have them both, sorry. You've got to have dynamism or family. You don't get them both. Um, <coughs> now, these two views are, of course, associated with this attitude <coughs> that America is polarized, that <coughs> you at Google, uh, by and large, are talking to a bunch of other liberals. And elsewhere in the country, places where you might be from, but you don't spend a lot of time now, um, all these people are talking to each other in a different language. And this is a, a worry that, that we have about politics. But there's another way of thinking about the two Americas, about polarization. Um, this is the, um, added, the idea that presidential candidate John Edwards was espousing. Um, the difference between people who have a job, who are doing fine, people like the people in this room, and people maybe a couple miles away from here who don't have a job and are focused on economic concerns. <coughs> now, what do the data say about this? I, I can't resolve the economic and policy questions, and I won't even try. But one thing I can tell you is what's going on in public opinion. What is the red-blue divide? Is it rich Democrats on the coasts and lower-income Republicans in the heartland? Or is the true divide the two Americas with well-off Republicans trying to fend off waitress mom Democrats? Or maybe polarization itself is overstated, an artifact of our two-party system and politicized news media that creates sharp divisions where none exist. <coughs> our story begins with an article in the Atlantic Monthly in 2001 by David Brooks. He drove from wealthy liberal Montgomery County, Maryland, where I grew up, actually, to rural conservative Franklin County in Pennsylvania, a place with, as he put it, no Starbucks, no Pottery Parn, no Borders or Barnes and Noble, a lot fewer sun-dried tomato concoctions on restaurant menus, and a lot more meatloaf platters. I'm sure you can get meatloaf platters here, too. Um, <coughs> but his article stirred a lot of debate. 
And I naively thought I could come in and clean things up. Because he was talking about rich states and poor states and how they're different, and rich counties and poor counties. But I knew that rich voters are more likely to be Republican. And I felt he was missing something. So I put together a team of students, uh, David Park, Boris Shore, Geronimo Cortina, and several others. And much to our surprise, things didn't come out quite the way we thought. <coughs> so what do the data say? <coughs> Here's the map of the 2004 election. You can see the blue states that are filled with rich, Starbucks-swilling Democrats here, <laughs> and, and the red states, which are just full of regular guy Americans. Um, <coughs> now, this is not just a, an illusion of the map. Okay, here are the 50 states, and I'm showing uh, George Bush's uh, percentage of the vote in 2004 versus the average income of the state. Bush won the 15 poorest states, starting with Mississippi at 60%. Um, John Kerry won the richest state of Connecticut and eight of the 10 next richest states, and, and so did Al Gore. And by the way, in 2008, it was the same, except everything was shifted down a little bit for the Republicans, but the pattern was still there. Um, at the same time, though, um, poll data show that rich people still vote Republican in nearly every state. If rich people were a state, at least in 2004, they voted like Alabama, Kansas, or Texas. If poor people had been constructed into a state in 2004, they would have voted like Massachusetts even though Massachusetts is much richer than Alabama, Kansas, or Texas. Uh, not just the 2004 election, here's House of Representatives elections. This has been going on for about 50 years or 60 years. Since the dawn of polling, this has been going on. Uh, so what's happening? Let's briefly return to David Brooks. Here are the 23 counties of Maryland <coughs> and the city of Baltimore. And here's Montgomery County, which is the second richest county in the state and the third most democratic. Now, from here, it was not hard for David Brooks to drive northwest to uh, some lower income, more Republican counties. And indeed, that's what he did. Now, I have no quarrel with David Brooks. And he did some reporting and found something that started off as a counterintuitive fact but became the new conventional wisdom. Um, <coughs> To, to, continue, to continue with some fact-based stereotyping, um, the dark colors show where more of these things are. There are more, Walmart started in Arkansas and has spread throughout the lower income, um, more Republican parts of the country. Starbucks starting in the Northwest and is particularly strong in some of the uh, richer places around the country. Um, bypassing Utah and jumping over to Colorado, as, as you see. <coughs> so different parts of the country really do feel different. People don't just vote in diff differently in different places. They don't just have different incomes. They really have different lifestyles. And this is what part of what polarization is all about. And part of the tension in understanding polarization is we have the rich poor lifestyle and the liberal conservative lifestyle. And in some ways, they line up. In some ways, they don't. <coughs> now let's. Um, Consider Texas. It would have been difficult for David Brooks to drive from a rich county in Texas to a poor county and get the same contrast that he saw in Maryland. The richest county in Texas is at Collin County. It's a suburb of Dallas and highly Republican. The poorest county, Safala County, is a rural county. And almost uh, very few people vote Republican there. Uh, a consistent pattern. There are some exceptions. Here's Austin, which is moderately wealthy and moderately democratic. Uh, but of course, David Brooks would not drive from Austin, Texas to somewhere else to make his point, because everyone knows Austin, Texas is unusual. It, the, the real point is that, on the whole, Texas has this pattern. He could not have done that. What I'm going to do for the next few minutes is to resolve the paradox that Democrats win rich states and Republicans win rich voters. And the key to the story, as illustrated by Maryland and Texas, is that different things are happening in different parts of the country. <coughs> Richer people are more conservative on average. Uh, but the difference between how rich and poor people vote uh, depends a lot on where they are. Uh, big differences in a state like Texas and small differences in a place like a state such as Maryland. 
<coughs> um, here's uh, our basic finding. This is Mississippi is the poorest state, Ohio is a middle income state, and Connecticut is the richest state. In each state, I'm showing the probability that you vote for John McCain as a function of your income. And we see that in Mississippi, the rich are much more Republican than the poor. In Ohio, the rich are a bit more Republican than the poor, averaging to around 50%. And in Connecticut, the rich are the same as the poor. Um, <coughs> my co-author Boris calls this the Anna Karenina graph. Uh, Tolstoy wrote that happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Similarly, we say that low-income people vote similarly in red and blue states, but upper-middle-class people vote differently. <coughs> um, the differences between red states and blue states are real, but these differences occur among the upper half of the income distribution. Let's look at it another way. I'll show you all 50 states, well, all 48 states. We don't have good poll data from Alaska and Hawaii. Um, this is, <coughs> these are the states that McCain and Obama won if you only count rich voters, middle income voters, and poor voters. This is not quite raw data. I did some processing um, because you have fairly small sample sizes in some states. So there's some hidden statistical analysis. But let's start with the rich. <laughs> Obama won uh, a few of these states in the Northeast and the Midwest and, and the West. McCain did very well among the rich, though. He won most of America. When you go to the middle class, you see Obama picking up a few more states. And then finally, among the poor, Obama won almost every state except for West Virginia and three mountain states. Uh, what these graphs here show on the right show that um, among the rich, there's a very strong correlation between state income and voting for the Democrats, but not so much among the poor. What's my point here? Okay, My point is that the upper left map looks like the red-blue map. It looks, it's the pure red-blue map. It's actually more like the red-blue map that is in your head than the actual red-blue map. It's the essence of it. Okay, These are these key states that the Democrats are winning um, because among the richer voters, we see this very sharp divide between rich America and poor America, red and blue America. As we go to the poor voters, we don't see such a big divide. Uh, we don't see so much variation. And we're not, we're not seeing that same sort of culture war happening here. Now, when I've given this talk before, people have asked about white voters. Uh, people are particularly interested in low-income whites. And so I ran the numbers. And th this is who would have won each state among um, rich whites, middle-income whites, and low-income whites. And of course, McCain did better among whites than among the general population, unsurprisingly. Um, he actually did not win. He, he lost the election among poor whites. Um, but he got, he got a, few, a bunch of these southern states that he was losing when you count everybody. Um, among rich whites, Obama didn't do so well. Uh, Barbara Streisand aside, he did not win California. We, we feel like we like to say in the book that her vote was canceled by Ted Nugent. Um, so they, um, <coughs> only really, only a few states. Of course, Oregon is almost all white people. So he won Oregon, which means he won Oregon among white people. <coughs> so, so far, I've explained the paradox, how rich and poor mean different things in different parts of the country. Now I want to explain how people could have gotten this wrong. And I have a quote from the left and a quote from the right. So from the left, Nicholas Kristof wrote in the New York Times, one of the Republican Party's major successes over the last few decades has been to persuade many of the working poor to vote for tax breaks for billionaires. Well, he said that even before they voted for Obama. But that's not really what he meant. Um, I, I think what he meant was not that they were voting for Obama, who would give tax breaks for billionaires, but rather that they were voting for the Republican Party. And that's wrong, actually. Um, the working poor, the lower income voters vote for Democrats. And it's also wrong because he says over the last few decades, but for decades this has been true. Um, so he, 
he got that wrong. Uh, on the right, we have Michael Barone, who said, who are the trust funders? People with enough money not to have to work for a living or not to have to work very hard. These people tend to be very liberal politically. Aware that they have done nothing to earn their money, they feel a certain sense of guilt. They are citizens of the world. We contempt for those who feel chills up their spines when they hear the Star Spangled Banner. I, when I spoke at the Princeton Club, they're all looking around like, you know. But, <coughs> <laughs> but he's wrong, too. Uh, because higher income people do tend to vote Republican, not Democratic. We don't know about the trust funders. We don't have a data source on that. <laughs> there is, however, data, because you can look at the political contributions of the Fortune 500 executives and Forbes 400 Americans. And indeed, um, 2008 aside, they overwhelmingly give to the Republican Party. So wrong and wrong. <laughs> Thomas Frank wrote a fascinating book about struggles within the Republican Party in Texas, uh, not in Texas, in Kansas. Oh, one of the conclusions, this didn't really come from his book, but one of the things that people misread from his book was they got the impression that what was the matter with Kansas was that low-income Americans were voting Republican, and they shouldn't be. That was the message people got. What's actually happening? What's actually happening is, in Kansas, the richer you are, the more Republican you are. Now, true, low-income Kansans and middle-income Kansans are Republican, but it's nothing special about them. To put it another way, Thomas Frank's problem with Kansas is not that these people should be down here voting for the Democrats. His problem is that he thinks he, he, his problem is really that the whole thing should be lower. Because the division between rich and poor in Kansas is really as big as in almost every other, and in almost any other state. Um, there, there is as much class-based class voting in Kansas as you see all over the place. Um, in addition, whatever is causing Kansas to vote Republican, it's not new. Kansas has been solidly Republican for over 70 years. So we cannot blame Kansas's republicanism on people's resentments about the 1960s, since it's been going on since the 30s, at least. <laughs> so now I have a question for you. How is it that informed people, that experts, can make such mistakes? Right? <laughs> now, if experts get things right, that's boring, right? But when they make them, they get it wrong, that's interesting. Nicholas Kristof can pick up the phone and anyone in the world will answer his phone and answer any question he has. And yet, he got some basic thing wrong. Michael Barone is the author of The Almanac of American Politics. He knows more about American political geography than everybody in this room put together. And yet, he's made, I have him on record, making elementary mistakes about voting. <laughs> Brief digression. Um, I tell my students when they're doing research, when they find a result, there are four questions they have to ask. Answer. First, what's your evidence? Why, why have you shown something rather than just asserted it? Second, how does it fit into your picture? You have to integrate it with what you told me yesterday. And you have to integrate with your textbooks. Third, how is this new? And finally, if this is, if this is true and it makes sense and it's new, how come the, all those smart people that came before you didn't figure it out? Now, that's something we all have to do, and that's what I'm going to do a little bit right now. <laughs> um, this is a quote that people just love. Um, Pauline Kael uh, said, I can't believe Nixon won in 1972. I don't know anybody who voted for him. People love this quote. It's false. She didn't say it. And, and, because she was not an idiot. And she knew that Nixon was going to win because they had these things called opinion polls, and they had these things called newspapers, and she had this thing called eyes. And you put that together, and she knew what was going to happen. <laughs> Yet we all love this quote. What's so lovable about this quote? <laughs> well, psychologists, cognitive psychologists, talk about the availability bias, which is um, <laughs> our, our tendency to um, make inferences based on what we personally see. So this sounds right, 
even though it didn't happen. Uh, because we know in our own life we do this all the time. We're constantly surprised that other people are different from us, right? And, and it, it's just, it bugs us all the time. And you could see how it would bug her, even though it didn't in this case. <coughs> uh, now here's a more sophisticated error. Uh, here's, I'm picking on Michael Barone again because he's such an expert. It evidently irritates many liberals to point out that their party gets heavy support from super affluent people of fashion and does not run very well among the common people. Wrong. OK, but what, why did he think that? OK, here's my story. <coughs> um, here are Michael Barone's friends, the rich and liberal. Michael Barone is rich and conservative, but he's, a, he's an influential journalist, and I think he knows a lot of rich liberals. They're up there. Here's the average American. It's in the middle because I drew the axes that way. So if, <coughs> if you and your friends are up there, and in fact, you all are up there, you along with Michael Barone's friends are up there, and the average American is here, then everybody else must be here, right? Because it has to balance out. Well, well, no. Actually, there's a correlation, a low, like a, a low but non-zero correlation between being poor and liberal or rich and conservative. The actual pattern sort of looks like that. It's in these quadrants. Um, and so it's wrong, OK? Now, we call this a second order availability bias. You're generalizing from a correlation that you see or infer. And this we do all the time. Um, and interestingly, the very fact of knowing the averages from polls does not save you here. Um, <coughs> Now, I think for the last time today, I'm going to tell you that richer voters tend to vote Republican. And we looked at this among subgroups of the population as well. We looked at lots of subgroups. In almost every subgroup we looked at, we saw this pattern. But there are a few groups where richer people were more likely to vote Democratic. Not a lot, but a few. One of those groups, journalists. Makes sense. Richer journalists are more likely to work for a place like the New York Times and be in a big city. Um, not a surprise, however, true. And given that Michael Barone and other David Brooks and other journalists live in a world in which there is a correlation between being liberal and being rich, it's just natural, again, for them to extrapolate that. <laughs> Beyond this, remember that I told you the Anna Karenina plot that the smallest differences between rich and poor are in the rich states, State, which is states like Maryland, Virginia, New York, California, states where the national media live. And in those places, they don't see it. If David Brooks lived in Oklahoma, I think he would be slapped in the face with this big uh, divide between um, did you do this when I said slept on the face? Did you actually do that? I just, I just noticed. Um, <coughs> that you'd see <coughs> that there, like, you, you'd notice that. Because there, the two Americas is really, is, is very highly correlated with how people vote. But not so much in, in California, for example. So it's very easy to get confused when trying to visualize how the other half lives. <coughs> Now, polarization is actually happening. It's not, it's not just an illusion. Um, <coughs> to make this graph, some of my colleagues did a survey where they gave sur survey respondents a series of questions, which were the same questions that a bunch of Congress members voted on. So you got to play Congress member and vote on 40 issues. <coughs> and then they scale you uh, to find out where you s fit on the liberal conservative dimension compared to how Congress members vote. Now, what do we see? Voters are divided between Democrats and Republicans. And so are Congress members. But Congress members are more divided than voters are. Voters are polarized. <coughs> the parties are more polarized. Now, what does that mean? Well, <coughs> on the issues, voters are mostly not that far apart from each other. Now, I don't mean voters are identical to each other. What I mean is a voter can have a mix of views. You might support gay rights, but low taxes or maybe the other way around. If you have a mix of views like that, you'll be somewhere in the center. It's a one-dimensional picture. Um, <laughs> now, suppose you're a voter, and you're trying to see, how, what do you think about the other party? Well, if you're a Democrat, you're probably around here, and you think the Democrats maybe are a little too extreme, but not too bad. But you hate the Republicans, because look how far they are. And if you're a Republican, you really hate Nancy Pelosi and so forth, because look how far they are. 
So the polarization of parties causes voters to have stronger partisan attitudes, even though voters themselves are not that polarized. So the comparison points are moving apart. And that's causing a lot of the polarization that we see. <laughs> so far, I've explained the paradox, how context matters, and how this is tied into popular misunderstandings. Now I want to talk about what this means uh, for American politics. And I'll start by going back 30 years, 33 years. <laughs> this was the presidential election between Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter. Gerald Ford won these red states and Carter won these blue states. The point of this map, it looks nothing like the recent maps. Ford won California, New Jersey, Connecticut, Illinois, and Carter won all of the South, but also Ohio, West Virginia, non-Southern states that you don't think of as being Democratic strongholds. <coughs> there was no relation between being in a rich state and voting for the Democrats. Why am I showing you this? To tell you that this red state, blue state thing is news. The fact that a lot of journalists started yapping about this in 2000 makes sense because they were noticing something new and surprising. It hasn't been happening like this forever. What has been happening forever is that richer voters tend to vote for the Republicans. That's been happening since the 40s. With a brief gap in the Eisenhower-Kennedy years, when the voters, when there was less um, class-based voting, uh, but only that brief gap. <coughs> so <coughs> um, what we need to explain here to understand is how it is that the states have changed, even though the voters haven't, right? It seems a, a, bit, a bit of a paradox. First, some explanations that don't work. <coughs> so is it rich people are changing? Are rich people now a bunch of liberals? Well, the people in this room aside, no. We showed that in the aggregate. That's not the case. Is it race? Well, you see the similar patterns just with white people. Weaker patterns, as I showed you earlier, but they're still there. Race explains some, but not all of the differences. Is it the South? No. If you exclude the South, we still see differences between rich states and poor states. Is it inequality? No, inequality is sort of a different factor, um, but it doesn't uh, particularly predict how people are voting. Um, <coughs> so what's happening? Well, we've already looked at voting, and I showed you how the poor vote similarly in red and blue America, but the rich vote differently. Um, now let's look at, let's step back from voting and look at issues, attitudes. Because <coughs> I'll tell you this. I can say with great confidence for every one of you in this room, including me, who votes, that we do not vote because of our income. And we do not vote because of our religious attendance. And we do not vote because we're Catholics or Protestants or whatever. We vote because of what we think is best for the country. Our income affects that, however. It's funny how getting a raise makes you feel a little bit better about the economy and a little more comfortable about things. So there are correlations. But fundamentally, to understand voting, we have to look at attitudes, not merely demographics. Demographics is not a true description of anything, at least not in the United States. Maybe in Iraq or countries with very strong ethnic voting, it could be different. <coughs> from the two, we took uh, survey data from 2000, the 2000 election, and every um, voter Every survey respondent, we gave them a position on a social issue scale and an economic issue scale. So you could be somewhere between liberal or conservative on economic or social issues. Then we averaged over states and groups of people. <laughs> Let's start with the red states. Poor people in red states are socially conservative and economically liberal. As you, as you get richer, rich people in red states in Republican states are very economically conservative, and socially they're about the same as poor people in those states. Uh, and we see something slightly different in the battleground states. And then if we go to the blue states like California, what do we see? In California, rich Californians are a bit more economically conservative than poor Californians, which makes sense, but they're also quite a bit more socially liberal. Uh, the, and issues. The rich, rich people are much more, and middle class people are very different in red and blue America, but poor people not so much at all. 
<coughs> and this indeed is our story, okay? And it has two parts. The first part is that the parties have moved apart. The parties have become more ideological. Uh, you can be, it's much harder to be a Democrat who opposes abortion or um, a Republican who will have liberal views on certain other issues. It happens, but not as much. Um, with the parties polarizing, the voters have had stronger views about the parties, and in particular, social issues have become more important in voting. As a result, in a place like Connecticut, rich, a rich person in Connecticut is conflicted because on average, he or she is economically conservative and socially liberal. In a state like Texas, there's less of a contradiction there because the richer people tend to be conservative in both dimensions. So a new dimension has been activated in American politics, and that's changed how rich and poor vote in different places. <coughs> Now that I've explored the paradox and how it's arisen over the past 20 years, I want to connect us to some deeper ideas about economic status and political beliefs. So let me start with a couple deep thinkers right here. Um, <coughs> these are supposed to represent um, here, uh, Barry Goldwater thought it was OK if the eastern seaboard floated out into the sea. That would be OK with me too, but not if it sunk, I guess. Um, <coughs> and so <coughs> the, the, the point being that among, the idea is that among richer Americans, this culture war seems so important. And among poorer Americans, it's the last thing on their minds is whether somebody goes to Star Starbucks or not. Um, <coughs> um, now, how do, how do political scientists think about this? Um, I, I have quotes from two non-political scientists first. And <coughs> so George H.W. Bush, um, as you can see here, he, you could say that he was agnostic on the issue of citizenship for atheists. Um, now, what's striking about this quote is not <coughs> so much that he said this, but, but that anybody would say this. Like, politicians are not supposed to want to piss people off. So presumably, it's only worth pissing people off if it makes somebody else particularly happy. Um, <coughs> And remember, George W. Bush, George H. W. Bush was a moderate Republican in the 1970s. So something changed, and presumably what changed was that he felt that this was the way to get the Republican nomination, that there, there had been a shift in what issues were important to the voters. Uh, and they weren't giving speeches like this back then, maybe. Um, David Brooks, uh, again, he said very few of us could name even five NASCAR drivers. I, I just love this quote because like as if he could name four NASCAR drivers. Like, <laughs> like what, there's like somebody junior, and then there's someone whose name is junior, and then like Tom Wolf wrote about someone, and there was someone died, and there must be, there, there's like a woman who does it too, so that's five, you know. So, <coughs> so the, the culture divide is so strong here that even when someone tries to explain the culture divide, he ends up looking a little bit foolish. And that's, that's how hard it is for us to understand others. And so that's why we use statistical tools. And David Brooks used statistical tools too. It's just that you know, I, it's my full-time job to do it. So I'd like to feel I'm a little better at it than he is. But, he's, but we all use these numbers because there's no alternative to using statistics. That's, that's all there is to, to try to understand about other people. <laughs> social scientists have two broad theories uh, to discuss social polarization. Uh, first being Karl Marx's idea of religion being the opiate of the masses. To update that would say that lower income Americans are voting bait, are distracted from their true interests by social issues, by God, guns, and gays, right? We've heard a lot about this. Um, bitter, I think that was the word that, that was used in the primary election. Um, another view uh, that political scientists have is called post-materialism, which is that as an individual or a family or a society gets richer, we tend to stop, we tend to put aside our day-to-day -day worries and think about the finer things in life, whether it be environmentalism, opposition to abortion, opposition to the death penalty, issues that don't affect us personally, but somehow seem more important once we can know that we can put food on the table. <laughs> two stories, two wonderful stories that are, both have to be true. There are definitely pe poor people who vote guide guns and gays, and there are a lot of uh, richer people who become post-material and think about other things in, in life. <laughs> but they can't both be true. 
right? Somebody's got to be voting more based on God, guns, and gays, the rich or the poor. It can't, it can't be both. We can't, I'm not going to let you hold these two ideas in your head at the same time without resolving them. I'm going to bring in some data. Um, <laughs> this shows the probability that, you'll vote, that you voted for Bush in 2004 as a function of your income, looking separately at frequent church attenders, occasional church attenders, and non-attenders. <laughs> what do we see? Among richer voters, church attenders are much, much more Republican than seculars. But among poor people, less so. I claim that this is evidence in support of the post-materialism hypothesis. <laughs> religious voting is not unique to the United States. In countries around the world, religious voters can consistently vote for conservative parties. And typically, it is the richer voters who are more divided by religion. We hear a lot about it here, but we're not special in that way. Um, it's also, I, I broke up this last graph here and separately looked at red America, purple America, and blue America. And indeed, in all three Americas, there is this interaction between religious attendance and income. In all these places, religion is more predictive of how you vote. It's not just, it's, it's happening in, in all different parts of, of the country. <coughs> Um, <coughs> so where do, we, where do we end this? Um, the problem of stereotypes, so I started off being upset about this because of stereotypes, because of the, the, the hypothetical battle between the Starbucks swilling Democrat and the holy roller Republican. And knowing that 50% of the people vote um, each way, I just know that 50% that of Americans are not yuppies. And 50% of Americans are not, um, are, are not extreme, extremely religious people living in the South. I knew that both parties have a more complex picture of, of who supports them. The problem of stereotyping is not so much that it's wrong. It's typically right in its details, but that oversimplifies. As I said, people don't vote because of their income. Um, evidence shows that people vote for the choice they think is best for the country. And what we've learned is that these are different in different parts of the population and in different places. George Clemenceau said that war is too important to be left to the generals. And similarly, statistics is too important to be left to the statisticians. I did a lot of research. We did a lot of research in this book behind the scenes, in or, but not like behind the scenes to present you with pretty pictures that you can read blindly, but actually to present you with numbers and pictures that you can read intelligently. <laughs> the usual way that you will present results such as described in our book would be using linear regressions and logistic regressions. We did a lot of that. Then we did some research on how to redo our analyses using only a small, losing only a little bit of efficiency in order to display things as comparisons. So we did a lot of work. And I think that's got to be a lot of what you do at Google, right? There's a lot, first, there's a lot going on underneath, and then you make a spiffy product. But you're not Microsoft, right? You're not making a spiffy, pro well, you're not making a product that, <laughs> that people are supposed to use like idiots. What you're doing is you're trying to help the user be creative. Help, you're, gonna, you're really making every user a developer. Right? Think of all the people who play with Google, do Google Fight, all that stuff. Right? But your research is allowing, is allowing the reader, the user, to engage their intellect. And that's what I'm doing, too. I want you to read a book like this and start thinking about it, um, not merely accepting our, our findings. Now, I know I've brought up a lot, and there's a lot more in the book. But I want to leave you thinking about three things. Um, first, that uh, there are different patterns within different states. And in particular, uh, the strongest patterns uh, between red and blue states are occurring among the upper middle class. Um, second, that it's natural for people to get confused about this because the commentators who are writing about this are not living in the places with some of the biggest income divides. And if I've refuted some stereotypes about Republicans and Democrats and giving you a sense of how the scientific study of polls and elections gives insight into how people vote, then I think I've done my job for today. And it's been a true pleasure being here, and I encourage you to ask any questions you might have. Uh, just go to the mic, wherever it is, and go for it.
Meanwhile, I'll show you what really happened in 2008 while we're waiting for the first question here. Okay. Yes. Hey, uh, good talk, uh, excellent talk. Uh, but I'm wondering which way the causality goes. So religion and religion was one of my my first. Uh, guesses, you know, this is all happening along religious lines, but how do you know if it's liberal people who are also more liberal with respect to religion and therefore um, less fanatic, and, uh, you know, versus the other way that uh, religion causes people to be, or lack of religion causes them to be liberal? Um, so there's three stories about religion and three similar stories about income, but let's do religion. And <laughs> story number one, which is really how we as political scientists tend to think of it by default, is that religion is a demographic variable. It's um, that you're born, you're, you're Catholic, you're Jewish, you're Protestant, you are what you are, you're a churchgoer, you're not a churchgoer, and that describes you. That it's not a causal story, it's a descriptive story. It's like social class, like what you might imagine you're a Sunni or a Shiite, whatever. That's story number one. Story number two is that religion has a causative effect, that you go to your church, and at church they say, don't vote for Barack Obama because he supports abortion, right? Um, story three is, this, is a sorting story that you said that, um, like Howard Dean, you decide that you're not comfortable with your church, and so you switch churches and a lot of, or Barack Obama for that matter. So a lot of people do that too. Um, to separate that, I think you'd, you'd have to look at longitudinal data and see how people's attitudes are changing over their life course, and I haven't done that. So I would put all my work in the descriptive category. Yeah, excellent, excellent talk. Uh, so the, uh, the question I had was uh, the likelihood of people voting based on their income. So you had a plot that you showed that the upper income kind of looked, the, the breakdown of upper income votes kind of looked like the red-blue states that we have that we have in our mind. Does that mean that, that higher income people are actually more likely to vote than lower income people? Um, high income people vote at about one and a half times the average rate. The top 10% of voter, top, voters in the top 10% of income represent about 15% of the vote. I think it's a temporary thing. It wasn't happening 30 or 40 years ago. I mean, that, sorry, let me step back. Richer people have turned out at higher rates for a long time. But the, the fact that the red-blue divide is stronger among the rich than the poor is actually something that's relatively new uh, happening in the last 30 years. So in some way, the political culture of a state somehow seems more determined by how its rich people feel than how its poor people feel. Um, but I, it, it, it's not really, that's sort of separate from the issue of how many people vote. Great. Thanks again for doing the talk. Um, the question I had was somewhat related to the polarization. I think I've seen some data that so, shows that sort of the more people become informed of the issues, that actually the more partisan they become. Have you seen this uh, research? And if so, like how might it impact what you find? And does that change over time? We live in an era with seemingly much more news, Google News, blogs, where people can become more educated. Might that be compelling people to become more uh, partisan? Um, yeah, uh, so yeah, consuming news uh, gives us information, but it also, it, it's associated with being more partisan. Some, a political scientist named Marcus Pryor has studied this, because like, your first thought would be, is it that, you know, does consuming the news make you more partisan by confirming your biases because you, you read your favorite blog or, or whatever? Or is it merely that part I mean, partisanship is, is rational. The parties are different. So the kind of people who care enough to know that the parties are different are the kind of people who care enough to read the news. And apparently there is some evidence that it's not merely a background very demographic thing. There's some evidence that reading the news has this effect. And I have mixed feelings because, as I said, I, I, I personally have, have strong partisan views, and, and I think it makes a lot of sense to have strong partisan views because the parties are distinct. On the other hand, there's tons of evidence that we talk about in chapter eight of our book that partisans are misinformed, are systematically misinformed. In 1988, there was a survey asking people how they felt about, oh, how, what they thought had happened to unemployment and inflation in the previous eight years. From 1980 to 1988, inflation went down from 13% to 3%. Half of the Democrats surveyed refused to say that inflation had gone down significantly. Like, they just didn't believe it. You know, I don't know. There's a lot of data like that. There's something like, in as late as 2006, something like 40% of Republicans surveyed 
said that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction, and 30% of Republicans surveyed said that we had found those weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> and so the, I, I, don't, I don't know what to think. It's, it's good and bad. Could you talk a little bit about any work you've done to do this kind of analysis for other countries, uh, other democratic countries, specifically India? Because I hear a lot about how in India politics is dominated by the poor. At least that's what the, the media tells us, but it's not clear from these results that that would be the case. Um, I, you know, this was a survey that we happened to be able to grab. India's, India's not here. It's, it's mostly um, European countries. And <laughs> India's a famous example because in America, as you might have heard, people, once people are in Congress, they stay in Congress forever. And maybe not so much in this area, but um, that's certainly the case where I live. And India is one of the few countries with a negative incumbency advantage. It's actually bad to be already in office because they're always trying to throw them out every, every election. And so India is a lot, it's actually a lot different in a, in a bunch of ways. And, and indeed, we are interested in studying it, but, but I haven't. So this is a little like the question two questions back, but it's different. So um, I'm not interested in exposure to blogs or things like that, but I'm curious how the data break out by education level. Um, the obvious intuition is that education level is highly correlated with rich versus poor. So does that mean that you can, you know, if that correlation is really strong, could you have redone the entire talk and not talked about rich versus poor, but talked about educated versus uneducated? Okay, the, the sh I think I have some education graphs here. Um, the, um, give me 15 seconds. I made them. Oh, yeah, here it is. Okay. Um, <laughs> the short answer is that education is important, uh, not as predictive as income, uh, partly because it's nonlinear. Uh, it's sort of, okay, these are, why is it blurry? OK, well, sorry. OK, but you can read it, it turns out, because I'll tell you what it is. Um, these are which states Obama or McCain won. Blue is Obama, red is McCain. Among people with the top row, the top line is postgraduate, like people with a degree beyond a college degree. College graduates, some college, high school graduates, no high school degree. And you see that Obama did the best among the, the least educated. But then he did second best, he did among the most educated. So it's nonlinear, it's non-monotonic. And so, and, and in fact, it's also less dramatic. Remember, among the poorest, he got almost every state, and among the richest, McCain got almost every state. It, it's not quite, a, income is, education's a little weaker than income as a predictor. Uh, it didn't used to be this way. This is another something from the past 40 years. Um, so it, it turns out, like, even within education categories, income matters. So what you should think about is someone with a postgraduate degree and say, who are they? Are they a teacher? Are they a social worker? Are they a lawyer or an MBA? OK, and they all have postgraduate degrees. So that's sort of one way of thinking about it. Um, uh, when you talk about polarization, coming from another country, I find American politics incredibly narrow in its range, uh, very little difference. Do you have anything to compare your results with other countries as to you know, how wide the range in politics actually is? Okay, well, according to my colleague John Huber, um, on economic issues, the Democrats and Republicans are further apart than the left and right groupings in just about any, any other developed country in the world. Now, part of it has to do with multi-party systems and other things. You could think about England, for example, where all three parties seem to have the same economic policy right now. Uh, my short story is that in Europe, <coughs> the welfare state is so popular that the conservatives cannot dismantle it, and it's so expensive that the liberals cannot expand it. And as a result, the parties cannot compete on economic policy, and so they compete on other things like immigration. And, and that's why if you look at, there are some countries where richer voters are much more re conservative than others, um, like the Czech Republic. But it, it's, it's actually, in, in most countries, the difference between, in most other developed countries, rich and poor vote less differently than America. And I was surprised to, to find this out, but once I heard it, it sort of made sense. It's part of our picture, which is that the Northeast and California are like Europe, and the South is like Mexico. 
Um, so I have two questions. Uh, one, why you actually got this picture up there. Uh, curiously, Israel really bucks the trend compared to all the other countries. Uh, why is that? Well, these, I should say, this is based on one survey, and it was the election. These are legislative elections, uh, this particular election. I mean, so the three lines represent frequent religious attenders, occasional attenders, and non-attenders. Um, and in that election, I believe that the religious party, the religious Jews in Israel were voting much differently than the, the non-religious. Um, income didn't, didn't, didn't matter too much. It's, it, there's, Israel has some demographic differences with historically the uh, richer ethnic groups within, the richer Jewish ethnic groups within Israel being um, a bit more uh, so economically liberal. Um, and so the other question I have is um, the so-called you know, traditional blue states, which um, tend to vote uh, Democrat. Um, I don't think I really understood why those states were behaving differently than the other, the red states. I mean, we have you know, rich people and poor people distributed all across the country. So what's actually changing those states? Well, people are more, um, people are more liberal. I mean, on economic and social issues in those, in those states. And voting has become more ideological. And so at the, the National Party, like oddly enough, it was actually not so uncommon for moderate people, political moderates in Connecticut to vote Republican way back when, even in presidential elections. But it just doesn't happen as much, as much now because voting is more, is, is more issue-based than it was 30 years ago. So it's not some difference between you know, the, 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 the difference between rich and poor in different states is, is relatively the same. There, there's a whole history of the states. So it turns out that being a rich state or a poor state now is the same as being a rich state or a poor state the first year we could find data on this, which was 1929. Basically, being a rich state generally means that you had a rich city 100 years ago, and you had a big, you had a big, a major city. And being a poor state means pretty much that you didn't have a major city or you weren't in the neighborhood of a major city back then. And things have changed. Um, Connecticut used to be rich because it had Hartford, Connecticut. Now Connecticut is rich because it has suburbs of New York. But the ranking of rich and poor states hasn't really changed. What, if someone wants to ask a question, you can hop up to do that if you... What? Oh, a remote question. Oh, I see. There's a face there. Okay. Question from San Francisco. Can you hear me? Yes. For the rich and poor state comparison, why is income used as opposed to net worth? Well, in surveys, it's just hard to get net worth. I mean, it's just hard to know what that is. Uh, we did replicate our analysis just using voters between the ages of, I think we did 25 and 60 to exclude students and retirees. But in general, we use income because that's sort of the easiest thing that you can get. I'd like to have net worth. That would be good, but don't really easily have it. I'm afraid we're out of time, so I want to thank Andrew Gelman so much for coming today.